Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another Community Empowerment Hour. My name is Maury Mungin, and I will be one of your hosts, along with Merlene Andre. Um, and again, we just want to welcome you on this evening. If this is your first time with us, we want to invite you to, um, in the chat, put your um, email address, send us your email address with your name, because we would like to stay in contact with you because um, we've put on a number of uh, programs and we have a lot more programs coming down the pipe. So we want to make sure you are in, you are in contact, uh, you stay in contact with us, so we stay in contact with you so that we can um, definitely keep you abreast of what's going on. For those who uh, have uh, tuned in uh, again this evening, and this is not your first time again, we want to thank you uh, for uh, coming on. And, and our goal is to, it's just so much information out there, especially dealing with health and other uh, uh, areas that we would like to dive into. Uh, we had a, a one segment when we did cooking class and and um, we did a lot of things on health, but we, 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 we have other things that we are scheduling um, just to give it a balance of, uh, of, of different information that we would, would like to, put, to provide to the community. So again, if, even if this is not your first time, but you have not given, given us your email information, please do so. Just put in the chat so we can stay in contact with you and we will um, definitely reach out as we bring these programs to you. Um, tonight, we have another special program and it's entitled Getting to Know You. And uh, we have Miss Amy Hayes that will be presenting uh, for us this evening. She is a very, very, very nice lady. I know her personally. Um, so I will, Begin with the word of prayer, and then I'll turn it over to Miss Amy Hayes. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we want to thank you for um, just the opportunity to uh, just to share the information that you've given us. Um, it's, it's just so much, and we thank you for um, even tonight using Miss Amy Hayes to deliver or to present to present to us. I pray that you would uh, use her uh, and, and giving your people the information that's so desperately needed to better our lives and better other people's lives with uh, different uh, uh, healing mechanisms and, and uh, just the understanding of our bodies is just so important that there's a lot of, there's so many diseases and things that we can pre prevent if we just follow the blueprint. So we just thank you. May you bless Amy and her presentation. And may those that are listening be blessed as well. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now I'm gonna bring up Amy and just to let you know, also towards the end of the program or not the end of the program, but uh, she's gonna present. And then we're gonna have a question and answer segment. So if she says something, um, just, Grab a piece of, uh, grab a pencil and paper and just jot it down that it may trigger something or question in your head so that you'll be able to ask that question at the end of the presentation. All right, I think I talked enough. Miss Amy, it's all yours. How you doing? I'm doing fine. Thank you for those kind words. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Okay. <laughs> Well, um, like was said before, my name is actually Amy Haynes. I'm a registered nurse for over 16 years now. I have my master's degree in nursing leadership and management, and I also got my bachelor's degree as well in um, nursing. Um, I am a wife for about almost 15 years now. I also have four kids, one boy, three girls, and I think I've done enough for that part. Um, but like I was saying before, um, me being a nurse, 
when I started, I really wanted to be a nurse because I wanted to be able to help those who are sick or those who are in need. However, when I started to do bedside nursing, I realized quickly that people just don't understand what's going on with their bodies and they take for face value what the doctor says or what other healthcare provider says, which there is nothing wrong with that. However, there are we are all individuals and one size does not fit all. Um, my title today for my presentation, um, if somebody will keep me honest with the time, I don't plan on speaking long, I'm not a long speaker, but um, I hope the information that was given to you will be beneficial for you. Um, as we said before, my title today is Getting to Know You, an Insider Sky to God's Wondrous Body that, um, that we have here, Wondrous Masterpiece. And just as a disclaimer um, that I will provide is the information provided has been proven both effective and beneficial for hundreds of years. However, due to certain laws and or restrictions, the information provided is not to diagnose claim to prevent, mitigate, or cure such conditions, nor to provide a diagnosis. Therefore, if you are ill, have any, disease, have any disease, are pregnant, or just improving your health, I'm required to tell you to consult a medical, direct, a medical doctor for medical advice, treatment, and services. So let's get into tonight's um, program for today. So I don't have a PowerPoint, presentation, but if I'm speaking too fast, just wave a hand or say, say a little bit of information and I will slow down so that you can get that information. Um, I'm not sure if you noticed, but with the emergence of certain diseases like COVID-19 and Ebola, health has been on the forefront of everybody's mind. Um, one of those things that we saw so far with um, COVID-19 is that we, the world, in essence, was duly unprepared for such a disease to wreak, to wreak such havoc on the human body. Um, therefore, it seemed that sometimes that we were scrambling just to understand it. The normal modalities that we that um, healthcare providers use um, weren't that effective, and people just weren't responding. Their bodies just wasn't responding the normal way that, per se, one would expect them to respond. However, um, one thing I've noticed is that we all need to understand how does your body respond to disease? Um, this presentation will not wholly be on a presentation on COVID-19, um, but it will be about how our body re responds to disease. How can, we, um, how can these diseases or treatments, um, how can we use them, or not disease treatments, how can we be able to to tell what is wrong with our bodies to our healthcare providers so that we can get a more individualized um, healthcare method. So just to start off, now, how exactly does the body work? For most of us, we have glossed over for our classes um, concerning biology, chemistry, and possibly microbiology for those who went into the sciences. Well, let's start off like this. We all started off as one cell, one cell. Now cells are the building block of all living things. We started off as a cell of one ovum fertilized by one sperm. Now from that one cell, it divides into two. Then from that two, it goes into four, then eight, then 16 and so forth. But have you ever considered that cancer is a result of rapidly growing cells that cause death? But in the case of the development of the fetus, it produces life. These cells then subdivide, these cells that this, that's um, formulating the um, fetus then subdivide so that it starts to specialize into different cells. For example, like heart cells, we have muscle cells, we have skin cells, just to name a few. In actuality, there are about 200 distinct cells that have been identified. So all of this is encapsulated into this itty bitty body of a human being form. Now, once these cells have finally specialized, they go on to form what we call the 10 organ system. These systems include the circulatory system, the digestive system, the endocrine system, 
the immune system, the skin, which is actually a system, the musculoskeletal system, nervous, reproductive, respiratory, and urinary systems. Now, with these systems combined, they form what we call our life support system for our body. Once we are born, our body is designed to survive at all costs. That is what our body is designed. From a simple cut that we get that we might think is simple, our body is designed to sew it up, keep it clean, and keep it moving. It does not like to be disrupted from homeostasis. It is always trying, in other words, to keep temperate. Now, in order for the body to keep in the homeostasis um, pathway, it has two major control systems. One of those systems are the autonomic nervous system, and the second is the hormonal or endocrine system. Now, the master gland for the um, endocrine system is called the hypothalamus. Um, the hypothalamus is actually responsible for either releasing or inhibiting um, secretions of the hormones by the pituitary gland. Now, I will try my best not to use, um, hopefully, big scientific words. Hopefully, I speak, as they say, in layman's terms. Um, but I'll try my best not to. There's just some words that you just can't gloss over. Now, these release, um, the pituitary gland, once it gets the signal from the, the hypothalamus, um, it releases certain hormones. These hormones affect our blood sugar, our digestion, the way food is assimilated into our bodies, um, the way the cardiovascular system responds, where we have epinephrine and norepinephrine, um, stress, liver, kidney, just to name a few. So in other words, the endocrine system um, is responsible for all our hormonal issues that we're having, whether that's um, the way our blood sugar is responding to food or or whether or not um, whether or not we are 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 doing um, are responding to our digestion. Um, the next thing, system that we have is the autonomic um, autonomic nervous system, um, and it's just what it means. It is a, it is responsible for the way that um, our heart is beating, um, for our heart beating, for us taking a deep breath, our eyes blinking and pretty much all the stuff that we don't think about doing. Um, so let's kind of pull it together a little bit. How does the body respond to a non-homeostasis um, state of being, or how does it respond to disease? For example, let's take the fact that we breathe. Um, normally, it's not something that we normally think about ever, unless somebody says, take a deep breath in and we go, and now exhale, and we exhale. Now, now the, the reason why we actually take a deep breath in is because we have a buildup of carbon dioxide in our body. And this triggers the body to then take that breath and to release the carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. As we exchange air, we release the carbon dioxide and now we have oxygen coming in. Another example for the way the body is trying to keep our, us into homeostasis or into temperance is hunger. Just think about the simple thing as hunger pains. Hunger pains are actually a result of our stomach kind of contracting, and then there's a drop in our blood sugar, thus indicating to our body that, hey, we need fuel. We need something to eat. Another factor that happens is a way that some of us respond to what we call the white coat syndrome. And the white coat syndrome is simply this, is when you enter into maybe a doctor's office, a hospital, or any type of um, healthcare provider environment, and then you see them and you immediately start to get nervous. Of course, me being a nurse, the white coat syndrome does not apply to any nurses, and that's my disclaimer, nurses never make people anxious. Well, you can hold on to that. Now, so when we have that white coat syndrome, our blood pressure is elevated. Um, when they take the blood pressure, like, oh no, your blood pressure is elevated. 
state and a prescription is written. Now, once that prescription is written, of course, you have already left the environment where you were told that you have elevated blood pressure, but because you have left the environment that was causing your pressure to be elevated, your body goes back into its normal state of a normal blood pressure. However, you fill the prescription like you should, you take the medication, and then the medication out is lowering your normal blood pressure that would have never been given to you. So the body is kind of responding appropriately, but unbeknownst to you, you did not realize your blood pressure was normal. You keep taking the medication. And of course the body is then raising up the blood pressure, causing what we now become a vicious cycle. Um, so another thing that is happening is that disease. When we think of disease, disease is actually an impairment of the normal state that interrupts or modifies its vital functions. As mentioned earlier, I talked so briefly about cancer and how it's being pretty much like a rapid cell development. Well, let's take cancer, for example. Cancer is, of course, another, um, another definition of cancer is when, excuse me, the body cells grow uncontrollably and spread to other parts of the body. Now, what are some causes of cancer? Some causes of cancer, of course, of course, some of you might've heard of, smoking, tobacco, our diet, um, physical activity, the sun, um, some types of, any other types of radiation, viruses can cause cancer, your environment, and also infections can cause cancer as well. Now, the body has its own type of defense system. As stated before, the body is trying to kill off this, this cancer or this rapid growth of cells, abnormal cells. In cases like leukemia, for example, which is a type of cancer, your warrior cells, which is the white blood cells, um, actually soar from a normal range, which is normally, roughly speaking, about 4,000 to maybe 11,000 a whopping 100,000 to 400,000 white blood cells streaming in the blood system. Now, the way that your body is responding to this cancer is indicating that, hey, there's something going on. And normally, if there's an infection, the body will overproduce white blood cells, your warrior cells, of course, to go and fight the infection. Um, but when it's doing this, it pulls a lot of resources from your body. If it needs to get that energy from your bones, from any other type of cells, it is pulling that energy, those resources from there. Um, just for a brief interlude. Now, when I say that it's pulling from cells, the circulatory system, which I mentioned earlier as one of our organ systems, that's life support, is responsible for delivering oxygen and nutrients to cells. And they take away waste and it also employs um, materials, it employs its um, ways to take away waste with arteries and veins, which is the body's superhighway. Um, as I said, it takes a lot of energy to produce that a mass amount of white blood cells. So what happens now is, since you're getting the energy pulled from your different organ systems or your different cells, um, the next thing you're going to notice is that you become fatigued. So of course, if you're fatigued, you want to rest more. Next, since most of the energy or nutrients are going to fighting the fighting of the disease and other normal cells become starved. So your normal cells, your red blood cells and others that were mentioned earlier, the over 200 distinct cells, um, it starts to pull that energy or those nutrients from it. And then hence now we have weight loss. Now, when we have pain cancer, pain is, occurs once those abnormal cells grow to such a mass that it's now pressing against our organs or it is actually blocking, um, blocking the circulatory system from functioning. So the body is trying its best, like I said, I, once it's born and it's on its own, there's some more umbilical cord, it is trying to stay in a survival mode of, hey, we just want to make it, okay? Now, however, when our body is trying to neutralize these things, neutralize these abnormal cells, it creates garbage bags. 
These garbage bags are better known as tumors. These tumors is the body's effort of trying to collect all these abnormal cells and put it into one, one area. And the body's, body's thinking, hey, maybe we could do one-to-one -one combat and that way we can defeat it. But what happens is, is that there's so much abnormal cells that yes, the body sets up little garbage bags everywhere around your body. Um, and it's what we call, if the cancer started, for example, in leukemia, in the blood, then it will spread to other places and that's what we call metastasize. So now these little tumors are spreading all over the place. The body's trying to fight it. The body could only do so much and it becomes overwhelmed and it cannot seem to fight any further without any type of assistance. Now, there's a saying that goes, prevention is better than cure. Everybody wants out there the magic bullet, whether it's taking 500 cc's of maybe um, of IV vitamin C or taking some prescription medication. Everybody, of course, who wants to be diseased? Who wants to have pain? Who wants to not be able to take a deep breath? Who wants to be suffering all the time? No one. Now, the thing with that, with this magic bullet or this magic pill is that it's easy for me to say maybe, hey, take some vitamins for your cold. And if that doesn't work, then take another treatment. Everyone wants the drug or that pharmaceutical or magic pill to relieve the symptoms. However, you don't, oftentimes people don't stop to think, yes, maybe my symptoms are now masked, but the true underlying reason is still there. You have not gone to the source of things, okay? Um, the fact of the matter is, is that no two people are alike. So when we're thinking about disease, when we're thinking about disease, even diseases like hypertension, diseases like cancer, when you take two people who might have the same type of disease function and you give them the same type of treatment, you will notice that one, hey, well, this person responded uh, appropriately, it would seem, to the medication or the treatment, but this person didn't. And they have to kind of, the healthcare providers have to kind of switch things around, adjust medications as necessary in order to help treat the person B, for example. But whether these applications, whether they're natural or synthetic, um, they could work for most, but doesn't work for all. Instead of us trying to what we call generalized treatment, it should be more individualized. This is where we come into play by taking time out to figure out how to get to know how your body works. Now, unfortunately, oftentimes people do not seek nutritional advice until a chronic disease has set in or dissatisfaction with the pharmaceutical or the drug treatment is, or is, has not been achieved. But sometimes it is too late for that advice. Like I said before, prevention is better than cure. And we'll develop in a little bit um, or delve a little bit into how we can possibly prevent diseases. By applying specific nutrients um, into our body when needed, sorry, by applying specific um, nutrients into our body when needed, um, it will help our body to increase um, its white blood cells or its efforts in order to overcome stresses that we allow to happen in our body. Now, there's a saying by Hippocrates. Hippocrates is considered the father of medicine or modern medicine. Before medicine used to be um, entrenched in, in, um, in superstition and religious beliefs, false religious beliefs that kind of swayed which way they were gonna do medicine. Um, and Hippocrates looked at it and said, no, that's not the way that we should do things. Hippocrates believed that natural forces within us are the true healers of diseases. So he believed that, like I said before, the body is at all costs trying to do its best to survive. Um, so it's set up in such a way that if one, body, one part of the body is not working pr proficiently, then the next part will kind of compensate. However, for example, when we look, 
look at the body. If anybody ever heard of cardiomegaly, um, all that big word just means that it is an enlarged heart. The heart is actually a muscle. That muscle, of course, like if we work out our regular muscle, can actually get larger, which is something that we don't want because that means that it is not pumping effectively. So if the body has a blockage somewhere, the heart will try to pump through that blockage or try to pump and overwork itself to make sure that one, that circulatory system is running, everybody else is getting oxygen, everybody else is getting the blood that they need, all the waste matter is getting pulled away, all the nutrients, everything is going one to another. But what is happening to the heart is, the heart is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, which is not actually a good thing. Um, as our heart gets bigger, the effectiveness of its pumping kind of gets weaker. And let's, let's just look at it. If you're running a marathon for two days straight, if you had to run a two day straight marathon and you never had a chance to stop working, eventually you're just going to collapse. And like I always tell people, you don't want your body to be the one to tell you to rest because it doesn't know how to act. It will send a message to the brain to shut down everything. And that's not where we want to be in. We do not be, want to be in a situation where we are, our body is telling us, shut it down. So what Hippocrates saw was that since we have these natural forces within us that causes us to have true healing of disease, um, he sought to actually use food. He used food in the sense that his, another famous quote was, let food be thy medicine and let medicine be thy food. Um, maybe 50 years ago, 50 or so years ago, or even long or before that, medicine and nutrition were in a very good marriage. They were getting along and everybody was working together. However, what we're seeing now is that they need to be remarried. Um, it would seem that they both walked hand in hand down the road, but medicine took down, medicine took the upper road and left nutrition struggling out there in the valley. Um, what we're seeing is, is that unfortunately, our medical profession um, from the last time I checked at least is not getting enough information. They do get a class on nutrition, but it's just usually a basic understanding of nutrition. Hence why we have, of course, we specialize in that too. Hence why we have nutritionists um, because the doctor does know, generally speaking, what is going on for nutrition for our bodies. But of course he doesn't know everything. And most people of course don't know everything. But like I said, that value, that marriage needs to come back together. They need, there needs to be a reconciliation of that with medicine and nutrition working together. Um, like I said before, with the emergence of COVID-19, um, healthcare providers all over the world, as we saw so frequently in the news, have been scrambling in order to kind of figure out what to do. What is going on? Why is things not responding the way it normally responds? For example, normally speaking, when somebody, when we see a normal oxygen rate of oxygen in your body is 100%, uh, 95 to 100%, they'll give you 95%. When they see you start going down into 80s, 70s, 60s even, everybody's going up in alarms, there's codes being called, everybody's rushing in because we're thinking now you need to be intubated and we need to allow a mechanical device to breed for you. However, with of course this disease of COVID-19, it didn't respond that way. It would appear that once the medical providers put the patient on the mechanical ventilator, that they actually got worse. They weren't breathing properly. So what they actually had to do was um, as, as people were struggling to figure out, okay, what to do? Many studies have you seen, and they're still ongoing, have been going on about how do we fight COVID-19? How do we get this thing under subjection? In other words, how do we get it back together where we can manage it and we could treat people and decrease the amount of people, of course, that were dying? Um, they went back to what they used to do in the olden days which was simple positioning of patients was one of those things they used to do. Um, you may or may not know, but sometimes laying what they call in the prone position really helps the person to breathe better, better 
um, because for them, it would almost seem with some patients, it would almost seem like they're drowning in their own fluids. Um, another thing that the way they were starting to fight COVID-19, of course, is with steroids. Um, the medication Decadron has been in the news, um, plasmapheresis from Demisphere is another way. But also what they also found out was, is that by also using vitamin D, vitamin C, also seems to have aid in the recovery of these people who had COVID-19. Um, articles actually have come out about good health, about good gut health that actually may help reduce the severity of that disease. Um, um, and forgive me, I forgot to write down the article name, but I will get it to you if you ask. Um, articles show that um, a diverse diet rich in fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and um, what they call some fermented foods like yogurts could play a protective role um, against severe forms of COVID-19. So whereas, yes, you may have gotten COVID-19, but at least it wouldn't be that severe if you have what they call good gut, gut health. Um, one thing to take note of is that most of these places that were ravished, unfortunately, with COVID-19, have adopted what we call the so-called um, Western diet. That Western diet, of course, is high in processed foods and refined sugars. Um, one of the things I even noticed, even when we were at the peak of COVID-19, when I went to the supermarket, was that most of the whole foods, like the um, collard greens, now that I live in the South, I live in the South now, yay, <laughs> is the collard greens so it's still there. Um, most of the fruits and vegetables, of course, were still there, but all the foods that would not assist our body in fighting this disease was, of course, totally empty. And the foods that will try to assist and aid in fighting disease, of course, was plentiful. Um, so we saw that with those countries, of course, like America, um, China, and all these that actually adapted these Western diets of, like I said, um, refined sugars, but it had low in fiber was that they of course was being hit hard with, with COVID-19. And of course now COVID-19 has developed into many, many variants. And we pray that none of those variants come here. Um, and if they have, we pray that we could effectively mitigate that. Now, one of these articles was written by um, a doctor, a doctor named uh, Dr. Kim. He found that the virus is able to penetrate the GI cells. So the virus can be able to penetrate the GI cells, which makes it worse for a patient's outcome. So people who had like what they call a weak gut, um, low in um, not probiotics and micro and uh, microbes, um, it made it easier for those organisms to infiltrate. One thing to take note is that COVID-19 was not or is not because it's not over. Unfortunately, it's not just a disease of the um, of the lungs. It actually also affected the kidneys. Of, of course, it affected your blood, which was thickening our um, thickening the blood. And it actually affected your um, digestion as well. Because as you saw, most people lost their sense of taste. Um, so these studies are actually ongoing and they're also evolving where they saw that, hey, people who seem to have developed a balanced diet, like I said, of fruits, vegetables, Whole, grain, whole grains have, have seemed to have had a decreased risk of getting COVID-19. Now, there's another thing here that comes into play. When we get to know the body that we have and we see how effectively it's fighting, then we won't misuse or abuse the body that we have. Excuse, excuse me. For example, if we anybody ever got a luxury car or even a nice, nice vehicle that we like, ooh, yay, we finally made it. And the dealer tells you, well, in order for this car to run to its best ability, you need to put in premium gas. Now, don't get me wrong, premium gas costs quite a bit of money. You might find yourself spending $60, per se, every time you have to fill up your gas tank. And whereas you're thinking, well, if I just put in good old regular, then, hey, I only spend maybe $30 and I save me a buck. 
But what will happen to that car or that vehicle is that, yes, you might have saved yourself a buck, but you're slowly, quote unquote, poisoning the car and causing its internal systems not to function right. Um, just like your body, the car might try to compensate in certain areas. And then you might notice that, oh, now my transmission's gone. Oh no, my engine is flooded. Oh no, what's that light? I have no idea what that costs. And now instead of you spending $60, which, um, which is expensive anyway for gas, then once you spend $60, now that you're sick, or now that the car is unable to work, now instead of $60, you're spending thousands of dollars in order to fix what damage that you have done to the car, AKA your body. Um, a saying goes here that I found out, I'm not sure who said this one, but it says that genetics loads the gun, but it's our lifestyle that actually pulls the trigger. Um, one thing that we often hear is that people often say to themselves, you know, it runs in the family. My disease runs in the family. Um, high blood pressure, diabetes, it runs in my family, but it doesn't have to continue. Um, one thing to take note of is that with proper nutrition, it can, in essence, mitigate that trigger of maybe diabetes starting, that trigger of maybe high blood pressure starting in your body. Um, once you try to take a look at, okay, Yes, it runs in my family. And you try to go back to what is the source or what is the cause of this disease keep running through our family? Simply by even taking a look at, hey, it would seem that maybe one, all the food that we eat seems to be high in processed food. Or if it's not processed, and yes, she's cooked from scratch, it's very heavy with, with overwhelming amount of butters, overwhelming amount of oil, um, or maybe even sugars. So that, of course, is going into your body, and sugar actually lowers your um, immune system. Um, so you will have to take a look at, well, maybe I need to change and eat better. Another thing that might be a factor, of course, is maybe everybody in the family, or if not, might have a sedentary or they don't move a lot type of lifestyle. The thing with nutrition is, is that nutrition, um, from an article written by Tamley Beasley, uh, she was writing in essence actually about um, uh, eating disorders, but I like what she wrote here where she's writing that the first and most obvious role of nutrition is to support the physical body itself. Now, all those social media, food, news, have um, demonized some foods, like of course, you all hear all the time, oh, carbohydrates, you can't have too much carb, you can't have too much, pro you know, you have low carbs, high proteins. Um, you know, there's a lot of these um, diets that go in and out of, um, in and out of vogue or, or out of play. Uh, but it is important to note that our body does need carbs, our body does need proteins, our body does need fats, and yes, a body does need sugar. Now, carbohydrates um, it actually is actually the fuel, or not just carbohydrates. When it breaks it down, when the carbs are break down, it actually is the fuel for our body. Carbohydrates um, of all types, proteins of all types, and fats of all types, they actually play a unique supporting role in healing and sustaining our physical bodies. These um, different foods um, or fuel groups work together. That's the thing to note. Our body likes working together. If you haven't heard me stress it enough, our body likes to be in homeostasis. Our body likes working together. So understanding what each fuel group provides and, um, and how each one helps to try to balance the body, um, balance our body would go a long way in helping us to know how can we prevent disease um, from going into that next step where instead of us, like I said before, paying maybe $60 for food that is a little bit more costly or fuel that's a little bit more costly, now we're spending thousands of dollars and sometimes insurance doesn't cover it. I know this because I work for the insurance company now. Um, I got away from bedside a little bit, but I work for the insurance company. Um, just to go on a little bit about carbohydrates. 
So carbohydrates, um, grains, starchy vegetables, fruits, and um, even water-based vegetables provide energy once again. And this energy can quickly be used up by our body, either by, um, depending what the body needs, either it might utilize utilize um, the energy quickly or it might slow it down. Um, the body actually turns those carbohydrates when it's broken down into glucose. Glucose, And glucose is the simplest form of energy that supplies the fuel for our body. So that being said, the next thing, so our body needs that glucose. Our brain actually runs off of glucose or sugar. So we do need sugar. This being said, it doesn't mean please go to your pantries, get a cup of sugar, pour it out because you heard the nurse said, hey, our bodies need sugar. No, it is in the proper form where it breaks down the sugar itself. Um, of course, proteins, um, the body needs as well. So we could get proteins, as you know, by eating certain animal, animal meats. Um, we could actually get proteins, a vegetarian or a vegan is not at risk for being lack of having protein if they don't eat animal meats. Um, they actually have more than enough proteins because you'll be surprised where protein comes from. You can even find protein in an apple, believe it or not. You can find in an apple, lots of nuts and seeds um, and proteins help with our body. If, the, if, the, if there is not enough carbohydrates that's being broken out into glucose, the body will use the secondary method of actually using proteins in order to break down, break it down into glucose, but it is not its preferred method. It actually prefers to do it via um, carbohydrates. Now, fat, fat. It doesn't mean um, fat actually fuels also our body. Um, without enough fuel for this fuel group, our body, our brain, our skin, and hair health, hair health bones, reproductive health cannot form, um, cannot function properly. Um, with our fat cells, it balances the carbohydrates. It helps to, um, by prolonging that energy because what fat does is kind of stores that energy. Um, you don't, of course, want too much fat because then it plays too much um, a risk factor. It can lead into developing diabetes if you have too much fat, especially around the abdomen. In the um in the abdomen area, so you don't want too much fat because what it does, like I said, is store that breakdown of glucose. And of course, once it might see glucose is low or sugar is low, it would slowly or maybe if it's not controlled um, properly in the case of diabetes, it might flood the system with too much sugar, um, and then you're finding yourself in um in the fact that now you have to take medications in order to fight that. Another por a portion of this is nutrition is that it helps support um, the role is to help focus our mind. Um, because like I said, if you're hungry, it is very hard to focus on trying to focus on maybe your work or day-to-day -day, um, activities. So if you have a proper nutrition, if you have proper nutrition, it helps to focus your brain power so that it could take care of just basic necessities. Okay, so um, the healing power of nutrition is a combination of multiple supporting roles that work together unselfishly in order to maintain homeostasis or in order to have the body running. Um, one thing that I would like people to also take note of is that one size, like I said, does not fit all. They have sometimes when you see these vitamins, dietary recommendation of vitamin A, the dietary recommendation of vitamin um, D. Um, for example, I have a child, one of my children, she has sickle cell anemia and she has to take now vitamin D, which of course now with the emergence of COVID-19 and everybody saying vitamin D is good for her, it's very hard for me to find now. But nevertheless, she has to take vitamin D. Now, because her vitamin D level is so low, and this doesn't represent all people with sickle cell anemia, her vitamin D is so low, she has to take the adult size recommendation. So normally, if I would give that to any of my other children who are um, roughly speaking, maybe the same height or, or weight as her, that will actually cause damage. 
you can cause damage if you take too many vitamins or too many herbs in abundance. Everything has to be in temperance. So with her, she's on a regimented amount of vitamin D. Um, that, of course, they will retest to make sure her levels are up. If you take, um, I'm not sure, years ago, um, somebody came out and said St. John's wort is great for depression. So everybody who was depressed went out, of course, and got St. John's wort to help them with their depression because maybe they didn't want to take their depression medication. However, they took so much of it that it actually had an adverse effect on um, on their body, and then St. John's wort, um, that herb got a negative or got demonized in in the scope of the media. Um, one thing that is lacking is that there is not. I'm glad to see the only good thing about COVID nineteen is that the reemergence of having nutrition at a higher level um, in order to help people understand how to take care of their body. Because with nutrition, with proper nutrition, um, it can help your body to do what it naturally does, which is to ensure that you survive. Um, I'm not sure how much time I have. Somebody will let me know. But um, by, by us taking our nutrition into effect, or by having a good, um, a good gut health, then we can take attack we could take to our medical director more not sorry i work for an insurance company and i just finished talking to the medical director our medical doctor we could take into the fact that we will have have more information to supply to them um there's a disease out there called fibromyalgia and for most part it affects women um fibromyalgia was considered a, a disease not really even a disease it was considered a psychiatric disorder because once Unfortunately, a, a woman presented to the doctor and say, doctor, I am having aches and pains all over. I don't know what it is. I did take pain medicine. I took a nice hot bath. I did this and this, but it's not working. What is going on? Well, of course, the doctor would oblige. He would do um, blood work. Um, he would do blood work for, for, for it. He would run multiple tests. And if, if everything comes back negative or it comes back normal, then he'll say to the woman, since it's a psychiatric disorder, hey, you, what you have is not, not a disease. What you have is a psychiatric disorder. And these women were being treated, was being treated um, incorrectly by, by, having, by giving them psychiatric medication. Instead of realizing that fibromyalgia really touches all the nerves in the body. And since our nerve endings are irritated, was affecting or shooting off misaligned messages back to the brain that there is pain. Um, fortunately now, um, after many years, many, many years, and many, many women later um, who suffered needlessly, now they recognize fibromyalgia as a disease. The whole, whole goal of getting to know this body that was given to us is, is to be able to go to our healthcare provider or our natural path or whoever you see, who you see to provide help and be able to voice like, hey, something is not right in my body. If you feel a pain that doesn't seem quite right, um, that you notice it's like, hmm, this is a nagging pain. I tried resting. I tried maybe medication. I tried um, everything else and it's not working. Go and see and talk to somebody that can further discuss this with you and tell them something is not right. Start a food journal or start a health journal where you say, okay, on day one, I noticed a pain in my stomach. It lasted maybe for five minutes. It seems to go and come and it's intensified because this allows, the doctor is not a fortune, a fortune teller. He can't really tell you what's going on in your body. But if he has maybe a journal of, okay, these are all the symptoms that it's having, he can narrow his thoughts and try to help you figure out what exactly is going on in your body and then instead of generalizing medic generalizing treatment, he can then narrow it down. Um, so with proper nutrition, like I said, if you are not eating healthy or a more, or more balanced diet, you can still have a new start in life. 
Um, there's an acronym that has new start that says we have um, nutrition for N, exercise for, for E, W is water, S is sunshine, the first T is um, temperance, the A is air, R is rest, and T is trust. Um, and trust in God. I'm a Christian registered nurse, and I really, um, depending when I took care of my patients, if they wanted to pray, I would pray for them. And in fact, for the ones who didn't want to pray, I still pray for them because in essence, I wanted to see them in good health. I do not like to see people suffering needlessly. And if there's anything that I can do in my um, little estimate of power, then I try my best to do that. Um, the one thing that we all have, that we all have is the power of choice um, our, or our will. We have the power to finally say in our heads that, hey, I've noticed that maybe one, um, you know, just for a simple thing, I like fresh pineapple. I've been eating fresh pineapple for years. But unfortunately, for whatever odd reason, years ago when I was in college, I noticed that when I eat fresh pineapple, well, my, my lips were tingling. And I was like, eh, maybe, maybe it's just tingling because I like the pineapple so much. Then, so of course, me being young and in college, or maybe that's not a thing, I continued eating the pineapple. Then I was like, eh, I think my tongue is tingling. I don't think that's supposed to tingle. But because the pineapple <laughs> was so good, I was like, I'll just eat a little bit more. And I added a little bit more of my, the pineapple. And I know I think my tongue is getting heavy. And it finally triggered my head that, hey, you have a choice right now, whether you're going to choose life or death. If you continue eating this pineapple, this might be the end of you. And yes, food is very tempting. Um, what they call good food or sweet tasting food is very tempting. It is something that can really be a hard struggle for it. But usually you could turn around that habit of just eating or consuming if you make a decision in your head to say, you know what, I'm going to incorporate more fruits and vegetables in my diet instead of me having even a whole bunch of carbohydrates. But believe it or not, vegans can have diabetes. How can they have diabetes? It is because if they have diabetes, it's because they eat too much carbohydrates. So that is telling you in essence that, um, that you're not balanced in your meals. Now there's not a certain amount that you should have, but your plate should look balanced. You should have a certain amount of food, um, what we call, remember the, um, the food pyramid, or now they have the food plate, where you would see, okay, I have my, my, I have my vegetables, I have my grain, I have my protein, I have my carbs but it shouldn't be overwhelming. One thing should not take over more. Um, it is better if you eat um, a balanced salad, diet um, and that is various, a variety of foods than one certain food. Um, and just to bring it to a close, it is like I said, in our power to choose between life or death. Even in the Bible, it urges us that we should choose life. Because for some reason, we are still attached or slave to certain foods that, of course, we love. And of course, that we taste. And we can remember when our mom made it, or grandma, or dad made it, or uncle made it. And food gets attached to memories. And we remember that time and remember how we feel. But if we take that chance to think about, hey, I remember how I feel. And I also remember thinking to myself, I didn't like or appreciate the fact that maybe one of my family members died from diabetes. Or I had to watch them get one toe cut off at a time, then eventually a foot, and then eventually the, the half of your leg, and then in some cases, even more than half of your leg getting cut off. I didn't appreciate that, and I don't want to go down that path either. Then it choose, it's up to you to make that choice If um, in order to stop the abuse of our bodies. Um, that's all I had to present today. I don't know if I did 30 minutes. I hope I did. Like I said, I don't usually talk for too long. Um, and this is our time where we're going to lead into, I saw some questions pop up. So this is our time to do questions and hopefully I have some answers. We shall see. Yeah, thank, thank you, Amy, um, for that. And um, before we move into the questions and answers, before I bring up Mar Marlene, um, we're going to bring up a, you will, you will notice a, uh, 
a question uh, pop up, a survey pop up. You should notice that coming up on your screen shortly. And we're gonna ask if everyone can just fill that out um, because we really wanna know what your interests <clears throat> are. And hopefully we can uh, present on some of those interests, in some of your interests. And, and definitely if we don't have your email address, this is very important. If we don't have your email address, please put it in the chat so that we can definitely stay in contact with you so that when we bring these programs, we can alert you and let you know. But Amy, you brought out some really key points that I, I uh, that kind of resonated with me. Um, and I think the main thing too is just we, we have to know our bodies. Um, that was one thing because one thing you said, everybody, you know, my body is different from yours and, and, and somebody else's body is different from the other person. So my fix is not your fix, your fix is not my fix. So sometimes it's, it's best not to say, hey, take this medication, it help you, or take this, it help me. Because again, your body's gonna react different um, than, you know, to something in my body, you know? Mm -hmm. And it, so what, what really got me, cause I started laughing when you talked about the, uh, <laughs> putting the gas in the car, because my wife, I had a car that, I mean, it clearly said high test gas only all over the place. But somebody told her that, ah, all gas are the same, you know, and, and doesn't matter. So unbeknownst to me, she started putting regular black gas in my car and I'm driving one day and I noticed oh, I, it, it, it didn't pick up. It didn't accelerate well. And I was like, something wrong is something happening to my car. And then it started rattling. <laughs> and that's when I knew. So I went to, I said, did you put regular gas in my car? She did tell me and she told me why, but she actually said, I do see the difference. So, you know, we just can't put anything in our bodies um, all this process stuff, you know, you have to know your body and you have to, I heard one lady say, create the right conditions for, um, so that your body can work to its optimum. So that, that I, I really appreciate um, so far what you, what you said. And now I am going to bring up Merlene Andre for some questions and answers. So are you there, Merlene? Yes, I am here and ready to go. The poll is about to be closed as we go into our Q and A's. Okay. All right, here we are. So yes, good evening everyone. And thank you so much, Amy, for um, a crock full of it, just lots of information um, that you have shared with us. And yes, we do have some questions um, listed already. And you know, uh, COVID-19 and the pandemic is on everyone's mind. Here we go. Um, so the first question I'm gonna bring up is, should we be concerned with the extended use of mask wearing as it pertains to the proper exchange of exhaling and inhaling air? No, you shouldn't be concerned about the extended um, wearing of masks. Most of the masks that people have anyway, it's not what we use in the um, hospital, which is the N95s. Those masks, usually the true ones that we usually use in the hospital have like even almost like a little barrier of um, of like a little plastic almost in there that helps to really refrain any of that air from going back and forth. The mask that we have is usually like the cloth mask. They might have like a little filter in it and it still allows you to have the even exchange of oxygen. Now you might notice that you might be a little bit of um, even short of breath of wearing it, 
It might make your face hot, thereby Are we losing Amy? Okay, here she is. Oh, there she is. Okay. <laughs> mute. You're muted, Amy. Oh, let's try it again. I don't know where I went. Here we go. Hi, I'm back. Welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> Can you still hear me? Yes, we are hearing you. You were um, continuing about the N99, oh. the masks? Yeah, so what I was saying is that there shouldn't be a concern because the typical mask, yes, you could buy some N95s outside, but they're not really the hospital grade masks that we use inside of the hospital. So you shouldn't really be concerned about the extended use of it um, unless your doctor or your healthcare provider says, hey, you should stop using the mask, then you follow their advice. Okay. Uh, here's another question about, well, this question is about the vaccination. If it becomes mandatory, do you think that Novavax may be a better alternative? You know, I just read about Novavax. I saw that that was another vaccine that was coming out. I was trying to figure out still if it was um, using the same method as um, Moderna and Pfizer, which uses the, you know, the RNA, messenger RNA. I know Johnson Johnson uses um, a variant of, of COVID-19, but I wasn't sure about that vaccine as yet. I'm still actually also researching that one. So just as you, as I do my due diligence, you do your due diligence as well. Um, I, I don't even know if they even use, they're still using it in trials. I think I know they're seeking FDA for it to be released though. And I'm not too sure about that one. Okay. Staying on the, the topic, how much does smoking impact vulnerability to COVID? Well, smoking impacts just a lot. Smoking just overall messes with your respiratory system. Smoking, when you smoke, it constricts your um, your vessels inside, um, causing you, if you might not notice, causing your body to compensate for the fact that it might not be able to take a deep breath. Now, if COVID-19 also is affecting your lungs by causing a whole bunch of fluid to be um, surrounding your lungs, which is not supposed to, so you can't take a deep breath. It's like fighting, it's like fighting two people at the same time and when they have a dual-edged sword and all you have is a stick. Um, so it greatly affects, smoking greatly affects how COVID-19 ravishes or puts you at risk for, um, for that disease. Okay, and now staying with uh, COVID and related to lungs, a question is asked, what can be recommended to a person who suffers from lung damage after having COVID? Well, from my notice is that um, a lot of people, yeah, they are suffering from lung damage. They also have scarring of, of, of their lungs. Most people still even have to come back home with oxygen. Um, I'm not sure if they're giving, uh, they might give some people um, what they call humidified oxygen. Um, you can also possibly see, because um, not most doctors practice this, but you can also possibly see by just taking some nice, nice hot showers with steam so that it kind of moistens, um, moistens the air and allows you to hopefully to take some slow deep breaths. Um, a lot of people are also doing something called chest PT, which is something simple. Um, that one you got to look up online, chest PT or chest um, percussions is just simply also, also was used for people with uh, cystic fibrosis where you're doing different positions and somebody is just slowly tapping on the, um, either on your back or on your side to help with um, air movement or even to help if you still have some phlegm or mucus in your system to help get it out. So it helps more to, um, to take a deep breath. But 
sometimes with the lung scarring, there's not much you could do with lung scarring because unfortunately you always might have always that scar. Hopefully there's a way um, by doing um, simple deep breathing exercises, using humidified air, um, maybe even possibly doing chest PT will help ease it a little better, ease your lungs into it a little bit better so you can breathe a little better. Okay, good to know there's something that can help with that. Okay, this thing called social distancing or physical distan distancing, uh, which is better, six feet or three feet? Well, like I said, according to whatever rule that the CDC has come up with now, <laughs> follow the CDC's guideline. If you haven't noticed, actually, one thing that we haven't really noticed or heard in the news is so by us by people actually doing what they normally should have done is when you're sick stay home or if you're sick don't sneeze in anybody's face or cough or when you're sick if you're outside wash your hands I mean these were basic things that for the flu was almost nullified you you barely heard anything anything about the flu I mean it's the lowest number of deaths caused by the flu so whatever the CDC is saying right now with the six feet, by taking those measures, or I think they said even three feet, because I think they want kids to be three feet to fit them in all classes, um, follow their guidelines. So far, it, it worked. Kind of, yeah. yeah, so far it worked. Okay, um, moving a little bit away from that, um, but also, uh, related to something you mentioned. You mentioned gut health. Does a person need to take uh, probiotics for to have a healthy gut? And what is prebiotics? Heard that recently. Okay, so probiotics and prebiotics, if we look at the root word pre, the, the prebiotics are something that you would take uh, before you eat. So it's like um, in order to help those microbes, it's something that you take before you eat, even the probiotics you could take when you eat. Um, but just having, in order to have good gut health, you don't necessarily have to take those medications. There's some things that can be found in the foods. Like I mentioned, um, even yogurts, they have probiotics. A lot of these things now they're putting um, these probiotics for gut health. Um, if you stay away actually from foods, if you do a simple thing like properly chew your food, because mm -hmm. um, it starts off, or digestion actually starts off in the mouth. If we properly chew our food properly, then I believe it's either protein, I believe is broken down, if I remember, it's broken down either in the stomach um, but if it's not chewed properly or if it's not um, done properly, then it will go into your intestine and the intestines is not there or designed to break down that protein. Mm -hmm. So now that it's in the intestine, it's causing it, I think meat stays in your intestine 16 hours. Um, so it's causing the, it's pretty much decaying in your, in your um, intestines and it's causing eventually you to have what they call leaky guts. Mm. So if you even start off by eating, like that's why I stress, try to stress like a proper nutritious diet, then you may not need probiotics. Probiotics doesn't hurt to take, but then you may not need it um, in order to have proper gut health. Hopefully that answers the question. Yes. Okay, so here is a question. Um, the questioner says, what can I recommend to a person who is on kidney dialysis three times per week? Is it possible for this to be reversed? Sounds like a big question. This is a disclaimer all over the board. With, um, with kidney disease, I will say this, there's nothing impossible for, for God to do. With kidney disease, however, you have to be very careful in the way that you treat it because your kidneys is responsible, one, for eliminating waste matter. 
um, and just for a brief thing, with renal disease or kidney diseases, that waste matter, matter cannot be processed normally, which is to urinate. So instead, those fluids are backed up into your, your system and it is, um, it is causing havoc inside the system. So if you can't eliminate the waste matter properly, then you're gonna run into a whole host of problems because you're not, some people of course can't make urine. So in order for you, for maybe even the possibility of that kidney disease to be reversed, I will highly suggest that you either go see, um, there are doctors who practice, um, if you don't wanna do dialysis, but they do practice um, naturopathy, they do practice homeopathy, where they do either a mixture of medicine and natural remedies that will help or assist you in that. So I will highly suggest that you go and see those doctors and be regulated in whatever manner you would get, whatever treatment that you would do. I wouldn't necessarily recommend anything because it might um, adversely affect that person. Okay, that does seem like a, a pretty situ serious situation. Um, here's a question. Actually, it's um, with my mom. She, her temperature, I take her temperature and her blood pressure every day, and it's like erratic. Um, sometimes it's kind of high, sometimes it's low, not super low. Um, well, both, the, the temperature as well as um, the blood pressure. And I, I used, I realized that um, when she would have a high temperature um, and some other signs, she would probably be having a UTI. But um, now I'm seeing that sometimes, you know, it just goes up and down. Now she did have hyperthyroidism, um, but she did the, what do you call it? The radiated iodine treatment. So she basically has no thyroid. And I think the thyroid does um, regulate your temperature and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I, I know I, I'll uh, end up going to see her doctor, but is it a, is it a chance that um, her medication may need to be adjusted? That um, those- Is she still, um, on, if, is she still on any thyroid? She is. Um, yeah. It may need to be um, adjusted that- um, I think it's sometimes it's called thyroxine. Um, I forgot the name of the medication. Levothyroxine is what she's saying. They, they call it a synthroid. Yeah, it's a synthetic version of what the thyroid normally would have done. Right. Um, so you want to mention probably to your doctor or her doctor that this is the case when I see this and this going on and it may have to be adjusted either up or either lower for her. Um, so that because that thyroid, like you said, is responsible for temperature control. And it's, of course, as you saw, it's affecting the way her body is responding to it. And of mm -hmm. course that medication is something she will have to be on um, for the rest, rest of her life. Right, right. Okay, we will look into that. So are there any questions? Did I miss any questions? I'm looking through the chat now. I think I have gotten them all. Okay. And if there are no other questions, we do thank you again, Amy, for a, a thorough um, I guess we can say an overview of uh, the body systems and how we should um, take care of ourselves. Definitely let food be our medicine. So I am going to turn it over back to Maury Munjan. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, Marlene. And thank you, Amy, once again for um, the information that you shared with us. And I just wanna uh, let everyone know uh, to save the date on the 29th. So that's in two, third, two, two Tuesdays, not next Tuesday, but the following Tuesday, we're gonna have another program and we'll be dealing with holistic health as well as hypertension. So if you, uh, 
two very interesting topics. Um, please invite those that, uh, uh, that you know would benefit from this uh, uh, the holistic um, way of treating a lot of your sicknesses and diseases, as well as how to uh, grab hold onto the hypertension that a lot of Americans are dealing with. So please include your um, information, your email address and your name in, or just if you're just comfortable to, with your email address in the chat so that we can put it in the database so that um, so that we can send you a reminder about our upcoming events. Thank you so much for um, uh, joining us. And there's something that, thank you for having, something that came in the chat, it just flashed up and that's what, oh, you're welcome. <laughs> um, but yeah, so definitely uh, stay in contact with us. And again, thank you, Amy. And I would like to close with a word of prayer. So let us pray. Once again, Father, we thank you for just the information that you've allowed Amy to share. May the words that were um, shared with us, we take and, and, and implement in our lives as far as uh, what we can do to, to, to better ourselves, better our lives and to share with others. You want us to be happy down here and live a prosperous life and to be examples of what you can do um, with our bodies if we uh, trust you with what you've given us, the information that you've given us. So we thank you. May you continue to be with those that have joined us this evening and, and may they share this information with others so that on the 29th, we can come back together again to learn more. So we thank you, continue to be with us this evening. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Mm -hmm.